uh, which is on algorithmic aspects of parallel query processing. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank everyone for staying for so long and coming to this absolute last tutorial of the absolute last day. Um, and uh, the tutorial will be given by Paris Kutris uh, from the University of Wisconsin, Semik Zalihoglu from the uh, University of Waterloo, and uh, Dan Suchum, uh, that's me, University of Washington. So the motivation for this tutorial should be clear for uh, everyone in this room. Uh, many data, uh, many large data analytics systems today, they process data uh, on a cluster, and I listed here many systems that do this, Spark, Dremel, Redshift, Miria, I'm not going to uh, read them to you. Uh, uh, many uh, people in this room, they uh, actually are uh, active users of these systems. Uh, they know these systems much better than uh, the presenters today. Um, uh, some of you actually know the internals of these systems much, much better than the presenters know today. Um, so I don't need to, uh, to emphasize the, the importance of using such an architecture for modern data processing. Um, the um, original reason for using a cluster for data processing is that we want to have enough computers in order to avoid, uh, in order to, to ensure that the entire data fits in their main memory. So the larger the data, the more servers we want to have, and this leads to a large, uh, to the need of processing data on a large cluster with dozens, but often hundreds or even thousands of servers or even going beyond. So this tutorial is about algorithms on processing large data sets on large clusters. Uh, the tutorial is based on a recent survey paper that the three of us wrote, uh, it appeared a few months ago, and uh, the uh, uh, publisher kindly made it available for free until June 18, and this is a tiny URL where you can download it. I'm going to read it for you, it's Y99W99B4, uh, and it's free until June 18. Uh, the entire tutorial and many technical details uh, are, um, I mean, the tutorial is based on this paper, and you can find there are many technical details, including the entire bibliography. We did not list it on the slides because everything is available um, in the tutorial. And I will list it the URL, we will list the URL again at the end of the, uh, of the tutorial. Okay, uh, here is a plan for the next one hour, one hour and a half. Uh, I'm going to briefly describe some model of, of parallel computation that we are going to use. Then most of the tutorial will be uh, focused on a parallel processing of joints, um, two-way joints first, uh, and then the much more interesting case of multi-way joints. Think of about these as uh, SQL queries with multiple joints. Uh, then we will also cover some of the traditional material on parallel processing for uh, sorting and for matrix multiplication, and then we will conclude. Good. Uh, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Um, and yeah, so let me start directly uh, with uh, models. Uh, in order to analyze and understand uh, the complexity of parallel uh, algorithms for query processing, we need to have an abstract mathematical model that captures these computations. The model we are going to use in this tutorial today is called the Massively Parallel Communication Model, MPC and it is a simplification of uh, the well-known um, BSP algorithm introduced by Variant in the 90s. In this model, computation happens on a cluster of nodes, which we will also call servers uh, or processors, and the computation uh, is performed in, in rounds. During each round, there is some local processing followed by global communication of the data, global exchange of the data. This is an abstract model of uh, what we know in, in databases as a shared nothing architecture. And this is going to be our, our model uh, for the tutorial today in which we will describe these parallel um, qu query processing algorithm. So here is a model in picture. Uh, so initially the data is distributed on P servers. The size of the data we will denote with in, uh, sometimes just N, um, so that's the input. Initially, the data is uniformly distributed. Every server has about uh, input by P amounts of data. Uh, everything in this tutorial that's read, that is part of the input. Think about uh, the input as being uh, large, like in the terabytes, uh, and P is the number of servers, uh, also large, but not as large, more like hundreds of servers or thousands of servers. So we have terabytes of data distributed on 
hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of servers. And um, computation proceeds in rounds. Uh, one round consists of local computation followed by communication. So communication is many to many, like in MapReduce or like in Spark. And the, com the computation proceeds in several rounds. Uh, and at the end, uh, uh, the, uh, the output, the uh, re uh, co result of the computation is stored on these servers. Um, we assume that uh, the servers are infinitely powerful. We do not care about the time needed for the local computations. Instead, the only parameters of the system uh, are the, max the maximum load, which is the maximum amount of data that any processor receives during any round of communication, and the total number of rounds. So these are our two parameters, the load, maximum amount of data received during any round of communication, and the number of rounds. Notice lo the load is L. We assume this can be large, uh, but the round is blue, which means we want it to be relatively small. To give you a, some intuition about the model, uh, let's examine a naive algorithm. Uh, here is how we can solve any problem in this model. Uh, make all the servers send their data to server number one. So that means that server number one has a load which is the size of the input. Uh, it's great, we finish in one round because server number one is infinitely powerful, can compute anything you want. But um, the load is much bigger than what we want it to be. We want the load to be close to, to the input by P because we want the servers to be load balanced. So this is a naive algorithm. We will not pursue this, of course. Uh, here is a second naive algorithm. Uh, uh, OK, so let's uh, send to the server number one only uh, input by P amount of data. But do this in P rounds. So after P rounds, server number one has collected the entire data. Uh, and now, since it's infinitely powerful, it can compute anything we want. The load is fine, but now the number of rounds is too big. We don't like this. Ideally, what we would like to have is a, is perf is a perfectly balanced computation where um, the, um, uh, the load per server is only the input divided by P, and the number of rounds is constant. Uh, maybe one, but it's a constant which does not depend on the size of the data or the number of processors. But in practice, this is not possible, as we will explain in this tutorial. Instead, the, we will settle for a constant number of, of rounds and a load which is slightly uh, super linear, um, which is the amount of data divided by P uh, times a small power of P. Okay, so instead of dividing by P, we divide by P to, uh, to, the, to, some no, to the power which is less than one. Okay, this is a model we are going to discuss today. Uh, in the paper, we compare this model with classical models of computation. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, so I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. Uh, but I refer uh, you to the paper to f uh, really understand the connection of, these, of our model to uh, classical models of parallel computation that have been studied in the last 40, 50 years or so. So to summarize, uh, the MPC model is a shared nothing, uh, is, is, a, is an abstraction of the shared nothing model of computation. Uh, it allows all to all communications. The data can be reshuffled like in MapReduce. And it only has two interesting parameters, two interesting cost parameters. Uh, the load, the maximum amo amount of, com of uh, data that uh, is incoming at any single um, uh, server, and the number of rounds. This is a model. Good. So that was the end of the introduction. Now I'm going to hand it over to Paris to talk about multi-way joins. Okay. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. So let's start with uh, the simple case of a data processing task you would like to do with this model, which is how we compute a join between two relations, right? So here we're going to use this notation of R, X, Y joins with S, Y, Z. So these are going to join on the variable y, and here you can see the corresponding SQL query that you would write that expresses exactly the same task, right? So this is a simple join, uh, uh, no, pro no projection, okay? So we'll discuss two types of techniques for a parallel join, and these techniques mimic the techniques that you also have in a, in a standard non-parallel system, right? So we're going to look at hash-based techniques and sort-based techniques, okay? 
So let's start with the first simplest algorithm, which is a parallel hash join. So how does this work? So here is some notation. So input is the size of R plus the size of S and the number of service P, as we said. OK, so what we do is you choose a hash function. And this hash function will basically take values from, the, from the, your domain and map them to one of the P servers, right? So it's going to take a value and return one, one of the ID of the servers. Now, uh, this algorithm works only in one round. What's going to do is that for every record, right, we're going to look at your local data. You're going to, and for every record, you're going to send it to the server by applying the hash function to the join attribute for R. And you do exactly the same for S, right? So you're hashing on the join attribute. And then it is easy to verify that if it's ever locally does the join on the data that it has received, you will get the correct result, OK? So this algorithm works. It's really nice. So now let's try to do some uh, formal analysis, OK? So notice here that uh, since you're having data of size in that you're distributing to P servers, your expected load will be n by P, right? But rem remember that what we want to analyze is not the expected load, but the maximum load, right? Because you could have that if you're sending a, a, a data of size n randomly, all of it to one of the servers, your expected load will be n over P, but your maximum will be n, uh, in, OK? So uh, let's start with a very simple case. And suppose that every value of y, this is a join attribute, appears exactly once in your data, right? So this is an extreme case of no skew, OK? So then what we can do is we'll apply this, uh, this bound called the turn-off bound. This is a standard bound that you, can, uh, you have in, in probabilities, which will basically tell you that uh, the probability that your load is far away from uh, your expected load, which is n by p, it, it's exponentially small, OK? So what does this mean is that for if your input is large enough, then you can actually show that with high probability, your load will be very close to the expectation, so it's going to be n over p, in over input over p. And remember that this is what we said is the best thing we can hope for, right? So for the case of no skew, we, the parallel hash join works in one round and has basically the ideal, uh, the ideal load. OK, so this is all good, but we assume that we have no skew. OK, so now let's try to, to see what happens if we try to introduce some skew. And let's do it in a very controlled way. So let's assume that now a value of y doesn't appear one time, but appears d times, right? So d now can, be, can vary from 1 all the way to n, OK? So then uh, the only thing that changes in this turn of bound is that this, this little guy d Right, which is the, the times that, uh, that the value, the maximum number of times that the value appears, is now part of the right hand side. It's part of your probability. Okay, so now let's try to see what, what this means for the load. Okay, so here is here's your graph, right, and here is what happens from different values of d. Okay, uh, let me see where is this. Uh, okay, it's here. Okay, so now if your d Remember that we said that if d is 1, then we, b before that we get that the load is n over p, OK? So now if d is much, much smaller uh, than the input over p, then you still get the same thing, right? So the, the previous result doesn't hold only for d is 1, but for values of d that are smaller in general than, uh, than your input over p. Now as you go, as your d goes closer to in over p, then we basically get about the same load and input over p, but we multiply by a small logarithmic factor that depends only on p, right? So we're about as close to the ideal, but we lose this, this small logarithmic factor, OK? Now, when d grows much bigger than input over p, all bets are off, right? So it could happen that your load would be as large as in, and in which case it's going to happen if you have one value that appears in every tuple of your relation. So in this case, since you're hashing on this value, all of this data will end up in exactly one, one server, right? So in this case, you are in, in, in pretty bad shape, OK? So uh, here is kind of a, a simulation of, of the, the previous thing that I said. Uh, we analyze. So, uh, suppose that your input is 100 billion tuples. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that uh, at most, you are at most 30% of your expected load with probability 95%, right? So we apply this inequality. 
uh, and say that this is what we want, right? So here is what happens, what is the degree that's going to give you this guarantee uh, as a function of the number of servers, right? So you can see here that if P is 100, right? So if you have 100 servers, whereas you want to compute your parallel hard zone, uh, then it's fine, your load will be under 30% of your expected for a degree up to 4 million, right? So that's, that's pretty good, right? So even if your degree is huge, if you have values that appear in 4 million of your tuples, you're still going to be fine, right? But now if, if P grows, right? So if P is 1,000, then your D becomes much smaller, your acceptable D, it becomes 10,000, okay? So what does this mean is that as the number of servers grows, then the effect of skew is more likely to be, uh, to be observed, okay? Which kind of makes sense, right? The more parallelism you want to use, the more obvious could be that you will have skew. Okay, now let's look, go back and look at the case that we said that we have the single value that appears in all of your elements, right? Where we said the parallel has joined does not do well because it's going to give you a load of in, okay? So, uh, we can do better in this case by, by doing the following observation. When you have a single value that uh, appears in all the tables of R and S you join, then essentially you, you are computing Cartesian product, right? Because here R had another attribute which is a single value and S had another attribute which is a single value, so you may as well compute the Cartesian product which is something like that, okay? So now let's try to see how we compute this Cartesian product better than the parallel has to an algorithm. So here is the idea. Uh, we actually choose two numbers, P1 and P2, such that the product is equal to P, which is the number of servers, and we organize them in a rectangle, right? So here you can see each cell is one of your servers, okay? Now, what do we do in, in round one? We actually, for every table from R, we pick a random row and we send it to all the servers in this row, okay? And for S, we do the same, but we send it to a random column. Okay, again, we're doing that using a, 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 has fun, a random has function. So now, uh, in the computation, you're still going to compute your Cartesian product locally on whatever data you received. Okay, so that's the algorithm. Uh, now, the question is, I didn't tell you how to, how to pick these shares P1 and P2, and it turns out that the best thing you can, ho you can do is you pick them so that the size of R divided by P1 is equal to the size of S divided by P2, right? Intuitively, the size of R divided by P1 will basically give you a sense of how much of R you will going to send, right? So you want to, and how much of S you're going to send to its, to its machine, so you want to make sure that these are about the same. Now if you do that, then you get a load that is two times the square root of R S over P, right? So let's try to unpack this. Suppose that R is equal to S is equal to some number N, then you get that your load is N over square root of P. Okay, now you can see that this is not as good as an uh, input over P that we get from the no skew case, but it's also not as bad as, as in, which is what we get if we blindly apply the parallel has zone, right? And we can, you can actually show that uh, this thing is optimal, right? We cannot do anything better than that, right? Where there is a lower bound for this case. You, you never care about the size of the output, right? You always have a, a, take care of the size of the input, but if the size of the output is really big, because here it's, it's big, no, it's quadratic. Yeah. Yes, so yes. Why maybe you is more complex? So we're going, to come, we're going to discuss a bit on the size of the effect of output well, later when we talk about multi-way joins. But yes, we care about how much data you are going to receive and not how much data you're going to have as an output. Okay. There are multiple reasons for that. One reason is that many times you're actually, you're, you're not interested in having your full join result, right? You may want to do an aggregation or you may to do something else. So maybe, you know, that's not the right measure. But we are going to talk about output, output in, in a bit, okay? Any other questions so far? Okay, great. So uh, a final point I want to make here is that when R, it's much, much smaller than S, right? What happens is that this guy, this rectangle actually becomes a single line, right? So in this case, what you're doing is that you're broadcasting R, so you're sending all of R to all of your machines, and then you're just partitioning S. Okay, so this is called the broadcast join, and uh, keep that in mind because I'm going to mention that in, uh, in a bit. <coughs> okay? Great. So, okay, so we saw the case where you have uh, extreme skew. We saw the case where you have no skew. We saw a case where you have skew where basically you have exactly degree D, but what can we do in the general case, right? Is there any way 
like, can we combine these things? And the question is that, yes, in the general case, you basically need to combine parallel hard joint together with Cartesian product. Uh, and in order to do that, we use a key concept of a heavy heater, right? So what is a heavy heater? It's any value of the joint attribute that occurs at least input over p times, right? Remember from the analysis that we did for the parallel hard joint, this is exactly the, the barrier where you're going to go over n uh, input over p, right, times a log factor of your, expe uh, of, your, uh, of your expected, right? So as soon as your, essentially as soon as, as long as your degree, the number of times it occurs is less than n over p, then you are close to the expected. If you go above, you're not, which is why we're using this uh, value as, as the, the threshold, okay? A value that is not a heavy is we call it a light heater, okay? So now how does, how do we combine these two algorithms? It's really simple. For the values that are under your threshold, you're just going to run your, your standard parallel hash join and analysis so that we can actually go close to the expected, right? So you just do your parallel hash join, you're good. Now, for the values that are heavy heaters, you're basically going to, to compute, to take the query that corresponds only to that heavy heater, which is a Cartesian product, and you're going to use the Cartesian product algorithm for that, right? You just have to, to take care of the following thing. You need to make sure that you are using ex, uh, exclusive amount of servers PI to compute that particular value BI, okay? And of course, you, I mean, you need to use, or you have only P available servers, so you need to make sure that the sum of these things is, is equal to P. And then if you choose it appropriately to the size of, uh, of basically your Cartesian product, you can actually show that we can get a load of this form, right? So here we have our in over P factor that we had before, and then we have an additional factor which is the square root of the output over P, okay? So now this is a bound that is output dependent, okay? Notice that the output is always smaller than input to the, to the squared, right? Because when we join two relations, you're going to at most get a quadratic result. So this will be at most input over square root of P in the worst case. But when your output is smaller than that, you are actually going to get a much better behavior. If you don't have any skew, then this output is about the same as your input, linear to your input. So basically, this, this, uh, this term is going to dominate, OK? And again, we can show that this is the best you can do if you, if you want to compute that in one round, right? There is, there's no way you can do something better than that. Yes? Why do you require the, the servers to be p joint for each? Here? Uh, so if you if you're not the join, then you have to add up the cost of sending data, right? So if you use the same things to do all the joins, you have to multiply it by the number of heavy hitters you're going to have, and then you'll, your load is going to grow. So basically, by being exclusive, it means that you're not adding up the load for all the Cartesian products that you are going to do. But you're using less servers, right? fewer servers. Yeah. So I mean, if you. Uh, Actually, I'm not sure. If you use all the servers for every Cartesian product, I don't think this is, you cannot actually get close to the optimal lower bound. The way to do that is to do the splitting and be sure that you assign the right amount of servers for each Cartesian product. Yes? Uh, really good question. Really good question. OK. Uh, so the short answer is that uh, you can pre-compute them, right? So you can actually spend, it's really fast because you, you can do a really fast sampling and approximately compute them or you can have pre-computed them and so on. The very important thing is that the, the notion of a heavy heater also depends on your size of the input and the number of servers, right? So basically what is gonna happen if P grows really, really large, then your like threshold is going to, to be smaller and then you're gonna have more of them, right? Uh, but yeah, that, that would be my answer. Either you have them or you can spend a round that is really cheap and, and, and figure them out. Any other questions here? Okay, let's move on. Okay, I'm going to go over that really fast, this slide. Uh, so I said we have two techniques, hash-based techniques and sort-based techniques. And the idea is that you can, you can also do kind of the same, uh, follow the same logic as we did, to also do uh, uh, the join uh, as a parallel sort join, right? The idea is that you take the two relations R and S, you union them, and then you, you do use parallel sorting for which we, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, in like 30, about 30 minutes, uh, but you're, you're using sorting on the value of the join attribute. So you're sorting everything by the join attribute. 
And then what you do is that basically uh, think you, you, for each server, right, since they're sorted, uh, tuples that have the same value will be there, so you can join them. Now the problem is what happens if they span multiple servers, right, so that could be if a value appears, again, is a heavy hitter. And in this case, again, you do the same trick of the, of the Cartesian product, right? So this algorithm will give you exactly the same, the same guarantee as the, as the Haspace join algorithm, but it just uses sorting, okay? Um, okay, so final slide on two-way joins is what happens in practice? So in practice, uh, parallel has join is the most commonly used algorithm. Uh, many systems also use this broad ghost join, which, ha which we said is what happens if one relation is really much, much smaller than the other relation, in which case you broadcast the smallest one and you partition only the bigger relation. And we're aware of Spark SQL that also uses a parallel short join algorithm. Okay? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, skew. skew is the, uh, right, so, I mean, bro the broadcast join works independent of skew, right? So, as if your uh, one relation is much smaller than the other, then, I mean, you should just use that. And the question which of these two is, the, uh, is better is not clear. I mean, even in the case of skew, it's, it's not clear which one of the two you, you can use. The, the short join handles skew easier than the half join. You don't have to pick your user. Right, you, st you still need to find if uh, uh, certain value spans multiple servers, right? Okay, great. So let's move to multi-way joins. Uh, so this, okay, so now we're moving from a join between two relations to a join between multiple relations. So the most standard example for that is what we call the triangle query. Imagine you have a graph represented by a directed relation, RXY, and basically, so here we have three, it's a three-colored graph, so we have RST, and then you want to find all the triangles, right? And let's assume that all the relations have the same size for, for the sake of simplicity. So it turns out that we can act, so a in a typical system, right, what you would do is that you would first compute the first binary join, and then take the intermediate result and then join it with, with the remaining relation to get the final result, right? So you have two rounds with two joins, but it turns out that you can actually compute this query in just a single round, okay? And this is an algorithm introduced by Afrat and Ullman in 2010, and then analyzed and optimized by Bimi and Dole in 13 and 14, okay? So here is how the algorithm works. So remember from the Cartesian product that we organized our servers in a, in a rectangle, now we're going to do, organize them in a cube, right? The, uh, the dimensions of the cube are gonna be p to the one third, p to the one third times p to the one third, so the product is again p. Now each cell in your, or in your cube is actually one server, right? So now what are we going to do for uh, the tuples from R, we're going to pick a random column, like a vertical column, and send them to all the servers in this column. For S, we're going to do that in the other direction. And for T, we're going to do it in the, in the other direction, okay? So that's how we, we communicate the data. So now if you do, uh, you can easily verify that basically if you have a triangle ABC that you want to find, the, you will find it in the intersection of these three, uh, these three hyper, like hyperplanes. Okay, so essentially if you communicate your data this way and then you compute your triangles locally, you're going to get the correct result always. Okay, so, okay, so the algorithm is correct. Let's try to analyze it again. So what is our result here? Well, our result is that we can compute the triangles with load n by p to the two thirds, right? Again, notice that this is not optimal. This is not n over p. Um, but it's also not n, right? So we're doing, uh, we're doing better. And again, we have to assume that our database has no skew. Okay, so this is the result for the no skew case. Okay, and the question is, can we do any better? Can we do, for example, n over p? And the answer is no, we cannot do that. If we use one round, actually this, this guy is the best we can hope for, again, right? So this algorithm is optimal. There is no way to do better than that, okay? Questions? <coughs> Great. Okay, now you, we can generalize this idea. If you have a general conjunctive query, uh, again, we can organize the P servers in a hypercube where the number of dimensions is the number of variables that you have. So you have one dimension of your hypercube per variable. 
and then you're using k independent has functions and essentially when I have you know take a fact from every relation you're going to hash on the values of the variables that exist in this atom and then basically you replicate to the rest right so again you find the proper hyperplane and send it and you can make the same argument as before that the intersection of all these hyperplanes will actually give you the correct result okay so let's try again the question is how do we choose the shares now okay so before in the, in the, in the triangle we chose the shares to be equal so now what what we're going to do is that we can actually create uh, a, so it's not obvious from this slide but you can turn this into a linear program and this linear program will actually give you the optimal solution for the shares okay again this is the case where uh, we have no skew okay so I won't go into any details of the, uh, on that uh, what I want to do is I want to present the, uh, the general results so for that let's do some refresher on covers and packings okay so bear with me for uh, for a minute so we can take we can take this query right and 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 take and translate into into a hypergraph okay so how are you doing that so this is essentially the, the triangle query okay so every vertex here is a variable so this would be XYZ and every edge is an, it corresponds to an atom right so that would correspond to a to a uh, to your triangle query and now a fraction let's cover wants to assign weights to the vertices such that uh, for every edge the sum of the weights of the vertices is at least one okay that packing is what we call the kind of the uh, dual problem where we want to assign weights to the edges so that the total weight on each vertex the sum of the uh, for the sum of the adjacent edges is at most one okay and you can show that basically these guys are always equal and then the optimal number will will call it tau star yes So fractional vertex cover assigns to vertices. It's a vertex cover. So edge packing assigns to edges. Right? We did it. Did we mix it or? Yeah, there's edge packing and vertex cover. So this is not the AGM result. It's different. Yes. Yes. That's exactly the interesting point. This is not the AGM bound. Yeah. Good point, but yeah, this is not the ATM bound. In the, in the case of the triangle, it's the same, but that's just by coincidence. It's, it's not true in general. Okay. Okay. So now, what is the result that we can get from the analysis of the hypercube algorithm? That you can compute a join with load. So here, essentially, you go over all possible edge packings, and it's the product of the size of the relations to the weight divided by P to the 1 over the sum of the weight. Of the, of the weight. Okay? So let's make it a bit simpler. Let's assume that all the relations have the same size. So then this formula becomes n divided by p to the one of the tau star. Where tau star, as we said, is basically the optimal uh, edge packing that you can have. Okay. So for the case of the triangle, this guy is three halves because of the half, half, half. So we get p to the two thirds, which we said is the analysis of the hypercube algorithm. Okay. Again, this is an analysis for data without skew. Okay, so if you have skew, this doesn't work. Okay, so let's look very briefly at two examples. So this is, uh, this is actually our, our uh, join query, our two-way join that we, we, uh, we, we had before. So here, here is an edge packing. You put one here and zero to the other edge, right? So you can see that basically this is the best you can do, right? You cannot find a better one. And so that will give you n is n over p. But, but this is exactly what we had from an analysis of the two-way zone in the case of no skew, right? We said that it behaves optimally. Okay, for the case of the triangle, uh, half, 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 tau star is equal to three halves, so we get n by p to the, to the uh, so this would be actually two-thirds, okay? Great. Uh, now, I guess I should... Take your time. Take your time, okay. Uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll take some more time to explain that then. So let's see now what happens if the relations have, have not equal size, okay? So uh, this, this is the different, so these are different edge parkings that we can have with the triangle, right? So this is the half, half, half. But now you're, yes? Before you, you 
Yes. So this algorithm is randomized, no? Because of the yes. So all this is. So this is. Uh, this is not uh, expected. It's with high probability your load will be that, which means that uh, it's it's a very um, tight result in the sense that it tells you that the maximum load, right? Not even the average. The maximum load will be that with high probability. Okay, and this probability, okay, depends on the number of servers that you use. This probability is really small, so it is inverse polynomially small to the number of servers. So it's basically you can you can think of that the probability is almost one, right? No, it's, it's exponentially small in the size of the data. Of the data and, and the service is not important. Or? The service is also important. In some cases of the analysis, it's also it's yeah. complicated. So <laughs> it's complicated. But, okay, but it's, it's a very low probability. It's very low, right? You can think of that as one as a high prob with high probability result that that will always happen. Good question. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's move on. Right, so now let's, okay, so assume now that the sizes are not equal, and let's look at different edge parking. So as you said, one is the half, half, half that we had before. So now if you apply, so this is the formula, if you apply it, you'll get the product of RST to the one third divided by P to the two thirds. Uh, but you can have other edge parking. You can have the one, zero, zero, that will give you a load of R over P, the zero, one, zero, S over P, the, and so on, right? So now what is the load? The formula tells that the load is the maximum of these two quantities all these five quantities, right? So you can ignore that it's basically the max of these four quantities. Now the important point is that it's not clear which one of these quantities is maximum. It depends on if R, S, and T is a, is a bigger relation, right? Or what's the relationship between them, okay? So when they are all kind of the same, then basically this guy is the best. Uh, you can see that, you can do the math and say when, with these holes, then basically you know, this is the best, and this corresponds to a kind of a broadcast join, corresponding to the broadcast join, but for the case of the triangle, and so on, okay? So I'll, I will think I'll skip this, this slide. Uh, okay, so that is the result of no skew. So now what happens when you have skew, okay? So skew data significantly degrades the performance of distributed query processing. And we have to do special things to treat the skewed values, right? Remember what we did for the two-way join when we had to do a special Cartesian product for every skewed value, okay? Unfortunately, uh, the state of the art in large-scale distributed system is like do it yourself, right? There is no good algorithm to treat skew, okay? So uh, I want to spend a very brief, uh, like just one minute to, to talk a bit about what we do with skew. And then Semik is going to talk more about skew in the case of uh, multi multiple rounds, which is more interesting, right? So here I, we are in the context of a sing just a single computation round. So the idea now is that we define a heavy heater, remember as before, as a value that appears more than n over p times, okay? And now what we can do is that essentially we're going to find all these heavy heater values that you could have and create what we call a residual query. A residual query is essentially a query where you replace, w by replacing the values with constants, you can remove these variables and if an atom has only constants, you also remove this atom, right? So it's a simplified query where you're fixing uh, the values of your, of your heavy hitters, right? And now if you're fixing the values, then the rest, the rest of the, the relation has only light hitters, so you can apply your standard, uh, your standard uh, hypercube algorithm with a, with a good analysis, right? So as we can actually show that you can, if you do that in parallel in one round, then you can actually get a load that is of the form p to the one over psi, and psi is this, this quantity uh, that is, uh, in general, it's going to be bigger than your, uh, than your edge packing. Uh, and again, Semih is going to talk a bit uh, more about that in more detail. Uh, what I want to finish is, is this slide. So uh, to give you a sense of what uh, the psi is, so here we have no skew, here we have skew. For the case of triangle, no skew is going to give us a tau star of three halves that we saw before. W with skew, we're going to get p to the one half, right? So here you can see that you get worse if you, if you have skew. But still, you can, you can be better than the trivial algorithm that sends, that sends everything to one machine. Uh, for the case of the join, uh, you get n over p in the case of no skew. In the case of skew, you get n by p to the one half and that corresponds to the uh, Cartesian product algorithm that we saw. And in general, again, you get from one tau star to one over psi star. And again, this is the case of only one round. So now Samih is going to talk about what happens when you have multiple rounds. Mike. And okay. 
So uh, in the next part of the tutorial, I'll extend the uh, one round results that Paris reviewed to multiple number of rounds. Uh, in, uh, in practice, uh, most queries on most BSP based distributed systems are executed in multiple number of rounds. So if you took, for example, this select from group by query and took any BSP based distributed system, say Hive or Spark SQL, uh, the system is going to execute it in two rounds. The first round, it's going to be spent to do the join between orders and customers, and the sec second round will be spent to do this group by by customer key and month. Right? So an in interest in interesting high-level question to ask about these uh, systems or the algorithms running uh, underneath these systems is that what is the computational power of rounds? What do these systems and algorithms gain by being able to run multiple number of rounds? Right? So, uh, I'm going to review certain uh, some some results in this space, but so kind of the upshot is that there's uh, this is now very well understood. I'll, I'll review a few of the results, but there are many open questions left in this in in this in this part uh, of the tutorial. So unlike the first part, where we have a quite good understanding of what can be done in one round, and uh, so basically every algorithm that Paris reviewed is tight. We can prove that they're tight. That they're the best things that could be do. There is uh, our understanding here is is a lot more limited. Right. So I'll come up to this, uh, sort of a uh, couple of interesting theoretical questions. Uh, in this space, right? So, but I want to uh, first uh, come back to this slide. Um, so basically, we looked at two cases of one round. The no-skew case, where, where the load complexity was determined by this quantity called tau star, um, and the skew case, where the load complexity was determined by this uh, another quantity size. So both of these quantities are essentially determined by the structure of the query, by the shape of the query. Okay, so your vertex cover or uh, quasi edge packing, whatnot, right? And what we showed essentially is that in the one round case, if the inputs are skewed, then query processing gets more difficult, right? And specifically, in sort of theoretically how you show this is that you can show that for any query queue, the size star of that query is going to be greater than or equal to its tau star, okay? So essentially saying that um, the query processing is gonna get more difficult. So your loads are gonna increase. Your scale to be scalability is gonna decrease, right? Uh, similarly, sorry, um, similarly, we can look at two cases of uh, multi rounds, the no skew case. And in that case, what you should get is that we should beat this no skew one round case, right? Uh, because, in, you know, we don't need necessarily need to run these extra rounds. In this case, we should beat this. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but at least in the case of extreme skew, this is indeed the case. Uh, for many queries, the skew, uh, uh, in the no skew multi round case, the load gets optimal. In, it reduces down to in over P, right? The other case is what if there is skew and we are able to run multiple number of rounds. And in that case, what we should get is something between this first column where there is no skew, uh, but we can run multiple rounds. Uh, so we should be worse than this, but we should be better than skew one round case. Again, because we don't have to use these extra rounds, right? So the interesting comparison is against this middle column. What if, the, uh, how, would, how would the load compare, load complexity compare against a no skew one round uh, algorithm, okay? So now we are able to run multiple number of rounds, so we have that computational advantage, but our inputs are harder because they're skewed, right? And it turns out that these two advantages are actually incomparable, right? So as I'll show you, the load complexity in the multi round skewed case is determined by another, yet another structural property of the query called uh, uh, a fractional edge covering number, the rho star, that's the famous AGM bound, and tau star and rho star are incomparable quantities, right? Sometimes they're equal, sometimes rho star is greater, and sometimes rho star is less than tau star, right? And in terms of the algorithms, I'll show you a couple of algorithms, and I'll show you uh, that they're tight for some queries, but the general case is open. So a general algorithm that meets this uh, rho star determined load as a multi-round algorithm is open. We don't have that algorithm yet. Okay, I'll show you a very specific query for which we actually don't know how to uh, hit, this, hit this bound. Right? So I'll show you a couple of algorithms, uh, but let me start with reviewing the AGM bound. So AGM bound is the answer to this fundamental question. Given a query Q, and I'll assume that uh, it's a joint query, I'll assume that the relations are of, the, of equal size, what is the maximum size uh, of the output? Right? The answer to that question is that given any fractional edge cover, I'll review this in a second, the output size of this query are under arbitrary instances, okay, in, in particular very interested in skewed instances, is less than or equal to in to the size of this fractional edge cover, right? So let me give you an example. So here's one query with three relations. In fractional edge cover, 
We are trying to, we are giving values between 0 and 1 to the relations such that each attribute is covered, meaning the sum of the relations that contain the attribute is at least 1, right? So here's one fraction let's cover where R gets 1 and T gets 1 and S gets 0. So X is covered because R is 1. Y is covered because T is 1. So this fraction let's cover puts a bound of n squared to the maximum size of the output, right? Here's a better fraction let's cover where R and T gets 0 and S gets 1. S, because it contains both X and Y, cover both X and Y. Okay, so this gives a uh, upper bound of in, right? So in general, uh, the fractional edge cover with the minimum weight gives the, gives the best upper bound, and that's called the AGM bound. So we're going to denote this with rho star. So the rho star for this square is equal to 1, right? So let me take this AGM bound and just give a lower bound of what could be the best thing for a multi-round algorithm. Uh, in terms of its load complexity. Okay, evaluating queries again under arbitrary skew. Right? So here's a uh, very simple countering argument to derive a lower bound of what would be the best thing to expect in the, essentially in this worst case setting uh, from a multi-round multi algorithm. Right? So suppose a multi-round algorithm is running on a cluster so, uh, and it's got a load of L. And I'm looking at this one particular processor, processor K. Right, so this processor K, each round is able to essentially receive L number of tuples. So over R round, it's going to be able to read R times L tuples. That's the maximum number of tuples it can know about or it can, it can, uh, it can receive. Right? So with this many tuples, R times R tuples, it can produce, by the AGM bound again, R times L to the row star tuples. Well, since there are P processors in this algorithm, together, they can produce p times rl to the rho star many tuples. And that has to be greater than or equal to into the rho star because there are many instances that have that many outputs. So for any correct algorithm, this quantity has to be greater than into the rho star. So if you just do the math and move l to the left, you get the lower bound on the load. That is for any multi-round, uh, say a constant round. Okay, so I'm going to fix the rounds to constant. For any multi-round algorithm, the load of the algorithm in the worst case has to be greater than in over p to the 1 over rho star, right? So that's uh, just some baseline of what's the best thing to expect from a worst case optimal algorithm, a multi-round algorithm. Good. So I'm going to show you a couple algorithms that hits this bound in a couple slides, but I want to start with the easier case of what happens uh, for a multi-round algorithm in the extreme no skew case. So let's start with the easier case. So we're running, we're able to run multi-rounds, but there is no skew in the input. So this was the case where each of the degrees are 1. Right? Each of the degrees of each value is 1. Well, in that case, we could simply do what most systems typically do. Right? Basically, run just iterative binary joins. Right? So we're going to take this triangle query, for example, and we can run this in two rounds. In the first round, uh, we're going to join R and S, and we're going to hash on Y, just randomly hash on Y. And that's going to get with high probability a load of in over P. That's the best thing we could hope for. Plus, and that's happening because the value, again, the degrees are 1. There's no skew. Plus, this intermediate table is also going to have a size of at most n. Again, that's happening because the degrees are 1. And then in the second round, we are going to join this intermediate table with t, hashing on z and x at the same time. Again, that's going to give us a load of n over p, giving us the output. So this can be done for any query. So in es essentially n minus 1 rounds, if you're able to run multiple number of rounds, we can al always, in this extreme case of no, no skew, hit the optimal load. That's the best thing that can happen, right? Uh, and the reason this is happening is, again, in this extreme no skew case, these intermediate relation sizes are not growing when we do binary joins. Okay? But with skew instances, that's going to grow, so it's going to cause some problem. I'll come back to that. Okay. So let me go to the harder case. Now let's assume that the inputs can have arbitrary skew. Right? Now the same trick of running iterative binary joins still works if the query decomposes into semi-joins. Okay, directly, if it directly composes into semi-joins, we can still run iterative binary joins. So for example, let's take this query. Again, uh, we have three relations. So if we ran iterative binary joins here, in the first round, we can join R and S. Now, we can't directly hash on X direct, uh, just blindly because there can be skew. But we can use uh, the skew-aware, essentially, uh, two-way parallel join algorithm that Paris reviewed. That's going to give us a load of in over p plus squared of r over p, which if you do the math, turns out to be in over p. That's the best thing that we could, that we could hope for. Moreover, because this is a semi-join, the intermediate table is again not growing. So this intermediate table size is going to be at most n. 
And the second round is a repetition. This is again a semi-join with a table of at most in. And we could again use this skew aware uh, parallel algorithm, giving us a load of in over P in two rounds. Right? So even, it, uh, even if there is skew, this technique of binary join still works, giving us the optimal load uh, if the query directly decomposes into semi-joins. Okay? Now I'm going to take a moment and just review one thing, which is that why couldn't we do this in one round? Why couldn't we in this, uh, for this semi-join query, for example, why could we not evaluate this uh, with a load of in over P? So if you remember, the psi star of this query is equal to 2. So in the one round, the best thing that we could hope for is a load of in over P to the 1 over 2, square root of P. Right? And the reason this happens is, if you look at this query, there's essentially this implicit Cartesian product in this query between R and T. So if you essentially remove S from this query, there's this Cartesian product between R and T. And any one round algorithm has to essentially implicitly compute that Cartesian product. Because in the one round case, what happens is that the machines wake up and they see, for example, an R tuple. And then that R tuple can potentially join with any of the T tuples. Right? And because the machines cannot communicate, uh, any correct one round algorithm has to have a distribution strategy that makes sure that R tuple matches with every T tuple. So there's this in square space of potential outputs, uh, which any one round algorithm has to compute. So that's why their loads cannot be in over P. Whereas with semi joins in the two rounds, what we can do is we can essentially reduce that potential output space, which is quadratic to linear with a single round of semi join. Right? That's kind of the power that we are getting with multiple rounds. Right? So let me go to another example of how to evaluate queries with skew uh, under arbitrary under arbitrary skew. And let's take the triangle query. So this query does not directly decompose into semi-joints. So we can't directly run binary joins. But what we could do is we could decompose into semi-join residual queries. Right? So what we'll do is we'll look at the values the degrees of the values in these tuples. And we're going to separate them based on whether or not they're light or they're heavy. So uh, the heaviness is going to depend on, uh, on P. But in this case, for the triangle query, if the degree, if you're going to look at a tuple from any of these three relations, and if the degree of both of the values are less than in to the P, in over, uh, P to the 1 over 3, we're going to consider them as light values. And that's, uh, on that light values, we are going to just run the regular hypercube-like algorithms from, the, uh, from that Paris reviewed, which will give us a load of in over P to the 2 over 3. Okay, that's still within our target. We are, the row star of this query is 3 over 2. Okay, that's what we are trying to hit. On the heavy values, and there can be at most, by the definition of the, uh, the threshold that we put here, there can be at most order of P to the 1 over 3 different heavy values. For each one of those, for example, z is equal to 3. Now, those, for each one of those, there's a residual query you can think of. And that's the query from the previous slide, which decomposes into a semi-joins directly. So on that, we're going to run this two-round semi-join algorithm from the previous slide. Right? So if you do that, on, on, if, you do that uh, if you run this residual query on p to the 2 over 3 of the machines, we're going to get optimal load for that many number of uh, machines. That's going to give us a load of L. Uh, in over p to 2 over 3. So overall, in two rounds, we can evaluate this query with this trick of um, residual queries with a load of into the p to the 2 over 3, which is the worst case optimum. That's the best thing, again, we can hope for. Question? Uh, considering uh, running these algorithms at the same time, like, if, if I choose the worst case optimum, do I have a single machine, like variable by variable? Uh, excellent. Uh, so I have one. Um, one sort of reference at the end, which I can sort of say, um, there's a direct sort of distribute, distributed version of those new worst case join algorithm, specifically the generic join algorithm if you're familiar with. Uh, that gives, that hits this load, uh, but only on when the parallelism is very large. And I can, I can talk more about that. Uh, there's an upcoming VLDB paper on that. Uh, but again, it's, it doesn't achieve it. It doesn't achieve this worst case load for sort of reasonably small number of processors, only at the extreme case. And I'm happy to talk about that. Question? Yes, so uh, at least in the sequential databases, when I want to do uh, multi-graph, uh, sorry, multi-joints, the thing that is usually done is to check which is the graph of the joint computation. Then given the, the, the selectivity of the joints, I know which joint I want to compute first. 
So uh, why is this approach not used in the distributed computational approach? Uh, I mean, so there's a little bit of that happening here by looking at the degrees. If we believe that the degrees is going, so if by looking at the degrees, and specializing the queries. If, so we are, we are essentially saying there's going to be selectivity is very bad here. It's going to grow a lot. And we kind of separate them, treat them uh, differently. So some part of it is happening here too. OK? Right. So, right, so we can, for the triangle query, we can also hit the worst case optimal bound for multi-round algorithms. So here's where I'm going to sort of uh, show you the, the open problem. So this heavy light and semi-join algorithm, heavy light decomposition, separation, and the semi-join uh, decomposition, uh, that, that's essentially what, what we are doing. By recursively, we can do this. So not just for the triangle query, but for more complex queries, we could keep doing these uh, heavy light separations and uh, decomposing to residual semi-queries uh, recursively. Uh, that will work, but it only works for um, relations with two attributes or some very special cases. And the general case of how to evaluate queries with this load is generally open. And here's what I want to leave you with. Here's a very specific concrete example query that we don't know of how to evaluate in uh, in over one over row star, basically. The row star of this query is equal to two. The size star is three. And we have a one round algorithm that already computes this in in divided by p to the one over three. We know that already. One of the algorithms Paris showed does that. But we don't have an algorithm that can evaluate this specific query with five relations with in over p to the 1 over 2, which is the lower bound that we have. Okay? So if, if you can come up with an algorithm that does evaluate this query with this load, it probably has the ingredients to generalize to uh, other queries. Right? Or the lower bound is not tight. So maybe there's a, for some things, there's another maybe property or structural property of these queries that can show that it actually the lower bound is not this, but p to the 1 over 3. So we don't know. But in the, in the previous algorithm, there's a heavy light semi-joint. So do the most uh, query in semi-joints with the 3 decomposition of the query? Or? Now, semi-joints you can directly evaluate with binary joints, iterative binary joints. So they just, they just work with optimal load. If, if the query directly decomposes into semi-joints. No, so for semi-joins, you don't have to decompose further. You can just run uh, directly binary joins. But I'll show you some queries which, for which you can decompose in more sort of complicated ways. OK. So, so even if that algorithm, general algorithm, that can evaluate any query in, in over p to the 1 over rho star exists, it may not be excellent because for some queries, just rho star is, is just simply very large. Right? So for example, for path 20 query, the rho star is 10, meaning that any algorithm like hypercube, heavy light semi or that possibly that general algorithm that we don't know of would give very poor scalability. That means with a rho star of 10, in order to increase our speed up by 2, we would need 1,024x 1, many processors, okay? So it's actually giving very poor scalability, right? So you might try something like iterative binary joins, but the problem under skewed cases is these, the, in these intermediate tables can get very large. Specifically, if they're larger than p times n, well, that means that during the computation, at some point, you're replicating your input p ways. Well, then you are better off just replicating from the beginning in the first round than not having extra rounds of computation and being done with your communication, right? So, but if the output is small, then semi-joins can still help in a different way, right? And I'll show you, uh, and it will help uh, basically by yearning this Yanakakis-like algorithms from, from, uh, for acyclic queries, right? So let me just remind you this algorithm. Yanakakis algorithm takes as input an acyclic query and the width one generalized hyper tree decomposition of the query. Uh, so in the original paper, it's called the join tree. I'll tell you a little bit about this. So if this is the query, this would be a GHD with width one, right? So GHD is essentially a, essentially a join plan where each bag here contains some attributes and some uh, relations where e the relations have to cover the attributes in that bag. And it's got several properties which I will not review, but one of them is, for example, that if you looked at any attribute and looked at the nodes that contain the attribute, that has to be connected, right? And the width of the generalized hypertree decomposition is the number of relations that's assigned to any of the nodes. So by definition, acyclic queries are the ones that have width 1 GHDs, right? So 
For this GHT, for example, this would be the joint plan. Essentially, GHT should be thought of as a joint, joint plan. This would be the joint plan. And the algorithm in the serial setting is going to do two rounds of semi-joints followed by a joint phase. Right? So initially, we're going to go through an upward semi-joint phase where we're going to semi-join each parent in this joint tree with its child, removing tuples that cannot produce any outputs. So in this case, for example, uh, they join on A2. So A2, 3 does not exist in R4. Therefore, we're going to remove this tuple. Right? We do this with every child, removing certain dangling tuples from these relations. Then we're going to follow with a downward semi-join phase, semi-joining each child now with its parent, so on and so forth. Uh, removing certain dangling tuples, followed by a final joint phase, where each child is uh, iteratively essentially joined with its parent. Right? So this algorithm is known to be instance optimal in the serial setting with a runtime of in plus out. Uh, and the reason is that after the semi-joint phases, it's guaranteed that if you do binary joins, that the output sizes will not grow, the intermediate table sizes will not grow more than the output. That's the advantage of this algorithm. Right? So if you just blindly distributed this algorithm for acyclic queries, where you each semi-join and join is done using this uh, uh, either skew aware or blind random uh, hash, hash uh, based uh, join two-way join algorithms, what you get is an order of n round algorithm that is going to hit a load of in plus out over p. Right? So that means you're getting essentially 2x processor means 2x speed up because of the speed. But obviously, this only makes sense if the output is small. Right? And in particular, as long as the output of a query is less than p times 1 minus 1 over rho star times n, this type of Yanakaki style processing is going to be faster than uh, the semi joint residual query, semi joint decomposition type of queries. Right? So just, you know. Here, the larger the number of processes you're using, the more outputs you can tolerate for Yanakaki-style multi-round algorithms to beat these uh, semi-join uh, reduction-based algorithms. Good. All right, so I'll just finish with this. Just a little bit. Yeah, three minutes. Just, just finish with this. Uh, we can actually improve this, not run in uh, order of n rounds, but order of d rounds, where d is the depth of the generalized hyper 3 decomposition. Uh, simply, let me just show you an example. So for some queries, like the star query, the depth of it's, it's got very short depth generalized hyper 3 decompositions. Right? So it's got a de decomposition uh, depth of 1. So for, for a query like this, we can actually, I'll just skip through it. It's um, for the sake of time. But what we can show is that uh, for any query, so let me just come to the result. Any query, let's just focus on with one query, so acyclic queries. If it's got a depth D generalized hyper 3 decomposition, we can actually run it with in order of D rounds instead of order of N rounds. So for the star query, for example, we can actually run it in three rounds, order, like order of one round. Uh, there's a multiplicative factor of three with the same load, without affecting the load anyway. So the load is still in plus out over P. Okay? So, um, that's where I'm going to stop in terms of multi rounds. So, uh, as I said, like, this is the one area of conjunctive queries, uh, the distributed evaluation of conjunctive queries, where the understanding of uh, the load complexity and what can be done with multiple rounds isn't uh, as well as what we know of what you can do in a single round. Right? So, I'll stop there and let Paris uh, talk about uh, sorting. Okay, so uh, okay, so we talked about zones. The next thing I want to talk about, and it's going to be uh, very brief, uh, is about sorting. We have the whole chapter in the survey, so please go ahead and, and take a look. But I'm going to spend some time talking about sorting. So sorting, as we all know, is a really fundamental task in any data processing engine, right? So as we saw, for example, when we want to do a join, one of the techniques is to use a, a sort merge join, a parallel version of a sort merge join. Uh, you can use sorting if you want to do a similarity join. If you want to do any grouping or aggregation, then you may also want to use sorting. So uh, it is really critical that we can do sorting really well. Okay. So uh, here I'm going to use the n to be the input size. So 
Uh, what I'm going to focus mostly on, I'm going to give you some other uh, mention of other algorithms in the end, but the simplest algorithm I want to focus on is called the PSRS algorithm. Okay? It's the parallel sort by regular sample. So the idea is really, really simple. Okay, so how do we sort? We find P minus, so we have P, P servers, right? So we find P minus one values, and these values are essentially going to split all our domain of values, right, into P segments, right? So we have P minus one split, we're gonna have P segments, and then we're going to take each segment and assign it to an uh, interval, that's here, and we're going to assign it to one server, okay? And then, if we have this partitioning, then it's when we want to communicate the data, the server can look at their data, see exactly what interval its value is, send it to the right server for that interval, and after that, essentially what you've done is that you've sorted your data across the servers, but not inside, so the only thing that remains to be do is do a local sort, and then you have a total sort, uh, sorted order of your data, right? Okay, so that, that, is the, that is the fundamental idea, and of course now the question you should be asking is, how do we find these splitters, right? Um, and here is what we do. There are multiple uh, ways to do that, but a very simple idea do is the following. Each server will look at its local data, right? So this is before we found uh, the splitters, right? Initially, you can have any arbitrary part of your data. So you look at your data, you compute the P minus one splitters of your local fragment, and then you send them all in a central location, right? So this central location is going to receive P minus one local splitters, which this is called the regular sample, from P servers, so there's going to be a total of P squared, okay? And then you're basically going to look at these P squared splitters and pick every, uh, sort them and pick every P th of, of the splitters. So from this P squared, you sort them, you pick P of them, and these are your general splitters, okay? And what we can show is that, well, if we do that, then we can achieve a load of N by P with only a constant number of rounds, right? So we basically need one round to compute the splitters and one round to shuffle our data and then sort. Okay, so two rounds, uh, optimal. Yes, question? Uh, how, how do you deal with skew? In the worst case, your array might have only one value. Right, duplicates, right. So this, this technique, as it is, works, uh, as I said, it works for when you don't have duplicates. When you have, then uh, you can actually do simple transformations to, to make it work. But if you're sorting and you have duplicates, you don't care about duplicates. Maybe yeah. you're interested in stable sort. No, I, I'm interested in what happens if one of your intervals uh, is spanning multiple servers. No, that, that, that's the point. So that, the, what this guarantees is that within each interval you will have a, the, approximately the right, the right number of, uh, uh, of, of values. Assuming no duplicates. Um, okay. Yeah. Let, let me backtrack. You, you're right. A skew is a greater problem. Add to each item its position in, uh, in the glo global position in the input vector. This eliminates the skew. So that, that's that's an important yeah. Yeah. So there are techniques to, uh, to deal with duplicates. Yes? But there is one round that you send a constant amount of uh, data, no? that is the, precisely the number of process proper, uh, like the number of CPUs that you have. Well, you yes. Know. And then you send all the data. So you also are counting that as a round? Because it's, it's so the first round will only send P squared, total of P squared data, right? Which is really small because P is your number of machines, right? Uh, yeah, you can see that's around, but it's going to be a very light round, right? Yeah. Essentially, it's going to do very, uh, it's going to be really fast, right? Because you're only, and you're, you're gathering your data only one or in, in one side, right? So that's going to be, uh, yeah, so that's, but it's still a round, right? We can't say that you need only one round, right? Te technically, you need two rounds, but of course, the one round will have a very small amount of communication, okay? Any other questions? Okay, so uh, two important things here. First, in order for that to work, we need the number of servers to be really, really small. Uh, uh, so in fact, it has to be smaller than the cubic root of n, right? Others, but this algorithm doesn't work. And the reason is that basically we're setting all p squared elements to one machine, right? So we have to make sure that p squared is smaller than your input divided by p, which is what we get this, this quantity. The second is that, well, I told you before that you actually have to go and locally sort the data, of course, that's going to be expensive. 
So what mo modern implementation of PSRS do is that you actually can sample instead of sorting, right? And then you, you won't get an absolute guarantee, you get a probabilistic guarantee, but it's actually good enough in practice, right? So uh, I'm, going to, uh, to, uh, I'm going to have a later slide on that. Okay, so what happens for larger values of P, right? What happens if P goes closer to N? Uh, so this is more of a theoretical interest than a practical interest because for more practical cases this quantity will hold, right? So you may as well use this algorithm. Uh, but there are two algorithms that we know of that, uh, that, that you can use. So one is Cole's algorithm. Cole's algorithm is designed for the PIRA model. And I won't go into any details. Go to the, to the, uh, to the book and, and read it if you're interested. The idea is that it was for the PIRA model. Uh, and if you have p processors, then you can solve that in time n divided by p to log n. So this is a different notion of time than the one that we have in, uh, in our MPC model uh, because we are in the PRAM model and not in the BSB or MPC model, okay? The kind of more interesting algorithm that's closer to our model is Goodrich's algorithm, which is designed for BSP. So we can apply it to uh, the MPC model. And there, this algorithm tells us that with load n by p, right, so this is optimal we can do, you need log, log uh, n rounds with base L to, uh, to sort, okay? So here notice that if L, uh, if you have, uh, if L is n by p and p is really small, then this quantity becomes a constant, okay? So we basically have uh, the same result as the PSRS algorithm, right? So for values of p that are much smaller than n, PSRS gives you uh, the optimal. So I forgot to say that this algorithm is optimal. It's the best we can do, okay? So, uh, but in general, this algorithm will be much better if your values of P are closer to N, okay? Deterministic. Yes, deterministic. and it's also the deterministic. No, uh, the PSRS or the Goodrich's algorithm? Goodrich's yep. deterministic. Okay, and the algorithm is really complex. Uh, we don't have time to cover that. Please go and, and read the book if you're interested in more details, okay? Uh, I want to finish with two things. First is lower bounds. So we can actually show that, uh, it can be shown that good algorithm is optimal. And in particular, it can be shown that the minimum number of rounds that you need to sort n elements is log uh, n with base L, right? So this means that good reads algorithm is the best we can hope for in terms of rounds. And also the minimum co total communication that you need, so overall all rounds, is n times the number of rounds. Okay, so this is the best you can do. You cannot beat this, this bounds. And notice, importantly, that these lower bounds are independent of the, of the number of servers that you have. Okay? So having more processors, it, it cannot improve your communication synchronization. By throwing more processors, you cannot, do, uh, you cannot use less rounds. Okay? Uh, the final slide I want to connect a bit uh, of the algorithm to practice, right? So, uh, as you can imagine, none of the good reads algorithm calls algorithm are used in practice. In the real world instances, as we said, P is much smaller than N. So now in the, in the regime of what we call coarse grain parallelism, right? Because P is really much smaller than your input, okay? And in this case, most of the, uh, of the algorithms that we are aware of use this PSRS method or a variant of thereof. So you find the splitters and then uh, you, you shuffle your data according to the splitters, you locally sort. And the variant is how do you find the splitters, how do you do the local sorting, and so on, right? So uh, I want to finish with this kind of benchmark, which is all the winners of the, uh, what's it called, the TerraSort, ter TerraSort competition. Uh, these are the times, and this is the number of processors that they used, and the memory per processor, right? And here you can actually see that for all these quantities, this, this thing is, is true, okay? Questions about sorting? Okay, so that's all I have to say about sorting, and I'll give it back to Semik to talk about max multiplication. Yeah. All right, uh, so in this uh, last technical part of the uh, tutorial, I'll, I'll review some very elegant results for matrix multiplication, focusing on what, what are called conventional algorithms for square matrix multiplication. So we're given as input uh, two n by n matrices, there's n squared outputs, and we're going to focus on conventional algorithms, which are those that uh, uh, essentially perform all of the n cube elementary products, right? So we are ignoring algorithms like Strassen's like algorithms for two reasons. 
One is that conventional algorithms are actually heavily used in practice. And the second is that if we allow arbitrary algorithms, then uh, essentially lower bounds become trivial. There's no good known lower bound. And the reason is that, in general, the complexity of matrix multiplication is open. Right? So there's one difference in the setup that, uh, in which these results have been published uh, compared to the conjunctive uh, queries a part of the tutorial, where we're going to assume in this setup that there is some machines in the cluster which have essentially L memory, right? So that they can, we're just, just going to assume that at any point during the computation, each machine can store at most L number of elements, right? So uh, you can think of this as, you know, we're essentially limiting the amount of memory that the machines have. And given this limitation, we're going to essentially try to optimize for number of processors needed, number of rounds needed, communication, etc. right? In the conjunctive query case, we were given P. We didn't assume anything about the memory. We just tried to minimize the memory. We're now essentially fixing the memory and trying to uh, minimize P, R, etc. right? So I'm going to start with a connecting matrix multiplication to a database query. So matrix multiplication uh, can be seen as a very specific uh, SQL query, where if the input matrices are given in these uh, tables with three columns, two for their indices and one for their values, then this uh, join and group by query is exactly matrix multiplication. We're going to join A and B on their J columns. We're going to group by I and K. That's going to give for each I and K N values, and we're going to sum them up. Right? So there's two parts to this, the join part and then the group by an aggregate part, they essentially determine different complexities in terms of rounds and communication. Right? So I'll, uh, uh, I'll mention a little, little bit about this. I'll focus on the join part, which essentially drives the main hard, harder part of this query. Okay. So let me start with the one round. What could be done in one round? So any one round algorithm, correct one round algorithm, has to have a distribution strategy such that at the end of the round, entire rows and columns need to meet at machines, right? Uh, because otherwise, we can't produce any of the outputs. Entire row and an entire column has to arrive at a machine. So suppose the L, the memory size of the machines, are 2TN, meaning we can send 2T number of rows and columns in total to any of the machines. Uh, the question, if you're trying to essentially maximize the number of products that a machine can, uh, elementary products that a machine can make, uh, can compute. The question is how many rows and how many columns should be sent? And the answer is uh, we should send equal number of rows and columns. So T number of rows and T number of columns uh, so that the, any machine can do T squared times N products. So for example, if T is equal to 3, meaning the load is 6N, so we can send 6 columns or rows, the best thing to do is send 3 rows and 3 columns to a machine so that, suppose the dimensions are 75, so we can do 9 times 75, which is equal to 675 products per machine, right? So that's the way, the, that the best thing to do. So the best one round algorithm is the following. We're going to divide the A into N over T uh, groups, rectangular groups, right? And B into N over T, I'll, I'm denoting that as K, K um, columns, column groups. And we're going to have a Cartesian product of these row, row groups and column groups. We're going to have k-square processors. Each process is going to get one row, col one row group and one column group. And it's going to do all the multiplications that it can do. Right? So if you analyze the, low, uh, the communication complexity of this, so for a load of 2tn, the communication ends up being n to the 4 divided by l. Right? So that's, and that's the best thing to do. Question? Uh, so, yeah, so I'm assuming, uh, so no, I'm, so if there is, say, n over t rows and n over t columns sent, the output, so you're getting only 2tn elements, but right? But you have to multiply them. Yeah, you have to multiply them, but the number of outputs is essentially t squared, right? So n over t squared. Uh, so it's the, if, so this is t, so this is t. So how many, how many output elements will you produce? There, this, is, there, this is D, and this is T, so you're going to actually produce T squared outputs. So you're going to produce very, very small number of outputs. Okay. And that's the, essentially the best thing to do. That's the best thing to do in a single round. Okay? So what happens if you can run a second round? 
Now, we don't have to send entire rows and columns to a processor, right? So we don't, we're not constrained by that uh, limitation. What we can do is actually we can now first perform some partial products and then aggregate them in a second, second round, right? And the right thing to do in this case is we're going to divide the matrices into you know, L over square root of L over 2 by square root of 2 blocks. And we're going to have, so let's call H, uh, n over square root of L over 2. So it's going to be H, so A and B are turned into H by H block matrices. So there's going to be H cube block multiplications that needs to be performed. So we're going to have H cube processors. Each one is going to do exactly one of those. Right? So processor 1, for example, gets A11 and B1H, so on and so forth. So the number of products then now we can do per processor is going to be Tn to the 3 over 2 which is a lot larger than the previous case with the same amount of memory. So instead of 675, we can actually do 3,375 products. So, we need, so you can think of this as we need significantly fewer number of machines to perform the products. So our communication complexity is going to go down significantly. Right? And in the second round, so this doesn't finish the computation. In the second round, there is for each uh, output block, we need to aggregate H partial products, so we do an aggregation round, which communication-wise is very cheap, though. Okay, so I'm not going to even analyze that. So we can generalize this to a larger number of rounds very easily. I'm going to analyze the cost in a second. But this, essentially, idea generalizes to even further number of rounds, more number of rounds, as follows. So there's H cube block products that need to be performed. If we have H cube processors, we can do them in one round, as in the previous example. But if we don't, we can actually group these H cube block products into groups in a very, uh, in a clever uh, grouping strategy where the block product AIJ and BJK is going to belong to the group GZ if J is equal to I plus K plus Z mod H. So that's difficult to digest, but I'll show you what this gives you, this modding technique gives you, okay? So in the end, though, there's going to be H groups. So there's H cube, block, uh, H cube block products. There's going to be H groups. Each is going to have exactly H square block products, right? And then each round, we're going to multiply as many block products as we can, depending on how many machines that we have, right? Plus a partial aggregation, right? So let me show you an example. This is, I'm uh, grouping into four by four blocks. Uh, a and B, um, and so there's going to be essentially four to the three many H cube many block products that needs to be performed. This is group one. There's going to be four groups. I'm showing you the group one. So the colors here mean that the blocks with the same color are going to perform, be performed in this group, right? So A00 and B00 will be multiplied, and it's going to be contribute to the partial sum for the output block C00. This mod technique, essentially, what it gives you is that in each um, group, there's going to be exactly one block product contributing to one output uh, block, right? So these are the rest of the groups. And uh, the way we're going to do this, let me give you an example, depending on how many number of machines is. Suppose we have H is equal to 4, and we have only 16 machines. So there's 64 block products performed, but we've got only 16 machines. So what we're going to do is, in the first round, we are going to perform the first group's partial uh, products, and we're going to get some partial sums. In the second round, we're going to perform the second group's products, plus the partial sums are going to be aggregated uh, as, a, as, a, as essentially a running aggregate. That's going to give us a second partial sums, so on and so forth. So in four rounds, we can compute the final output. If we instead have 32 machines, we're essentially embarrassingly going to parallelize these group products. So in the first round, the first 16 machines are going to do the first group products, and the second 16 machines are going to do the second group's products. That's going to give us two partial sums. Then in the second round, first 16 products are going to do this, the, the third and fourth, essentially, groups are going to multiply in the second round, giving us two partial sums. Now, that's the end of the block computations. All we have to do is aggregate these partial sums, and we can use the first 16 products to do that. Okay? So it's actually a very sort of simple way of using more rounds if you don't have enough machines to, to do this in two rounds. We can do it in three rounds, four rounds, so on and so forth. And it's the uh, optimal algorithm for multi-rounds. So this, this algorithm, I'm not going to analyze it, but it uh, it's essentially solves this problem. It's got the best round complexity. It's got the best communication complexity for any, any particular uh, L. Okay? 
So that's where, that's where I'm going to end. And Dan is going to conclude uh, the tutorial. Thank you. Uh, question? Okay. Sure. Uh, so there is results on like if you if you focus on other types of algorithms, like Strassen's like algorithm. There's also very nice results about the best communication complexities that you can get in different number of rounds. Uh, I'm not covering them here, uh, but we have pointers to those in in the in the in the paper. We don't review them, but we have, we have pointers to them. And yeah, I mean, so Strassen's algorithm. I hadn't seen a constant round version of it, maybe, but uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, how, how it works. All right. Okay. Are you going to use that? Okay, so now I just need to find the. Um, right. So uh, we only have a few minutes, so I'm going to uh, conclude, and the, uh, all the details that we skipped they are uh, available in the paper and much more. Uh, so, uh, a quick summary. What have we seen in this tutorial? So we focus most of, um, of our uh, tutorial on describing joints, uh, how to compute joints on a uh, distributed cluster. Uh, then we also reviewed some classical results from the 80s and 90s on how to compute in parallel, how to sort in parallel, and how to do dense matrix multiplication in parallel. Uh, in all these algorithms, the goal is to minimize uh, two objectives. The, um, uh, the communication cost, which we defined as to be the maximum number of data that each server receives during uh, each round, and also the total number of rounds. Now, of course, in practice, you want to minimize the total runtime, uh, but, and uh, the, 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 so you need to combine these two somehow. The exact combination depends on your architecture, on the relative cost of um, uh, the internal algorithm that depends on the load and the number and the cost of the communication. So here are two main takeaways. If you, uh, if, you, uh, if, you get, if you take two things away out of this uh, tutorial, then these are the ones. Namely, for skew-free data, we understand perfectly the complexity of computing the multi-way join on in one round. And this complexity is, give, is given by this interesting parameter, which is a fractional edge, uh, fractional edge backing number or the fractional vertex covering number. Very confusing, it's, that's it is tau star. Uh, when you move to multi-round, uh, we only understand the, the, the complexity uh, when the data is skewed, uh, I mean, when the data is unrestricted, I should say, and in that case, the complexity is given by the other number, the fractional edge covering number, rho star, uh, which is the one that you might know from the AGM bound. Uh, and interestingly, this is an interesting fact that is specific to us, to data management. Uh, the total amount of communication that you need, you must perform in order to compute a multi-way join uh, is much larger in general than the size of the input data. Not very surprising because often uh, the, the end result is much larger than the input data, so we need to communicate this somehow. Uh, but it turns out that this even holds if the end result is small. Uh, and the one round, the lower bounds that we have proven, uh, they um, show that you need to communicate more than your total amount of input data, um, even though the output is small. So these are the two main takeaways. Um, okay, uh, for the matrix multiplication, the, uh, uh, this is a brief review of what is known from, uh, from the classical results. Uh, for matrix multiplication and sorting, there is no skew. Uh, so essentially there is no penalty in terms of communication. The algorithms uh, are in somehow perfect. The total communication over all the servers, not, not on one server, but over all the servers is uh, proportional to the size of the input. Uh, and here the main takeaway is that when uh, the number of servers is relatively small, like uh, the input to some fr uh, fractional power, then the algorithm is simple. Think about PSRS, the, the, that sorting algorithm that essentially implemented today in practice in all parallel sorting uh, algorithms. Uh, the, the, the challenge uh, is when the number of processors gets close to the size of the input data. Uh, it's of theoretical interest. Uh, for what we know so far, the number of servers is much smaller than the size of the input data. Uh, but it's something to consider if you ever move to a setting where you have millions of servers as opposed to thousands of servers. 
Uh, okay, I want to finish with uh, three open questions. Uh, we do not know how to extend the uh, sorting based algorithm to multi rounds and to uh, compute um, multi way joint uh, multi way joint queries. We only have understand how to use uh, sorting uh, merge sort, the standard textbook merge sort, to compute a single join. And there, interestingly, the analysis of the of, uh, of the skewed elements is simpler than for hash partition. So this is one open question. Can we extend sort-based algorithms to multi-way joins? Um, secondly, as somebody pointed in, in the, from the audience, uh, most of our analysis, except for that special case of, of um, um, uh, single join, most of the analysis depends only on the, on the input. Essentially, our algorithm aim at partitioning the input data in such a way that uh, every server can compute the output locally without any more communication. But often, uh, you can actually um, per get to better algorithm, think about Jim or the generalization of Yanakaki's algorithm, uh, if you also take into account the, uh, the output. Uh, but we do not have a full understanding of the complexity as a function of both the input and the output. And finally, uh, the lower bounds that we have for, for multi-rounds, and somehow uh, it are, are easy, they, they, take, uh, they, they take a shortcut. They rely on the fact that on some inputs, your output data would be huge uh, because of the skew in the data. Uh, and that forces you to, um, that, that um, imp implies that the amount of communication is high. But we know, I mean, we conjecture uh, that uh, even for examples, for some simple examples where the output uh, is, is not bigger than the input, um, uh, ma even multiple rounds are not enough to compute the query with a linear amount of communication. We just don't know how to prove those uh, lower bounds. Good. So on this note, I will, uh, um, I will f finish. I will uh, point you again to our uh, survey paper. And this is a uh, URL where you can get it for free until June 18th. And I will stop right here and take questions. <laughs> and I, actually, why don't you join me to um, take questions? Yes, please. Right, so um, I said incorrectly uh, that the, the only reason uh, that the communication cost is larger than the input is because the output size is large. This is actually incorrect. Uh, we know examples of queries uh, for which the, the um, communication uh, requirement seems to be large, even if you allow a constant number of rounds, um, even though the output is, is bounded. Uh, in particular, what, um, what, um, what he asked is, uh, what happens if, you, if you're just interested in counting, in counting the number of outputs? Uh, we don't know how to prove lower bounds on the communication costs. Uh, we believe there's, there, is, uh, there are such lower bounds, we just don't know how to prove them. Uh, yeah, even computing size, even computing, even checking if there exists at least one answer, uh, we conjecture is hard. Uh, the simplest example that I have in mind is a five-way uh, is a um, five-way uh, join uh, with a chain, so a chain with five queries. Uh, we conjecture that this cannot be computed in two rounds with a linear amount of communication. You need three rounds. Uh, if you're guaranteed that the output is, uh, uh, is, is small, or if, if you're just interested in counting the size of the output or checking if the output is non-empty, again, we conjecture it's not possible to check this in two rounds. You need three rounds. Any more questions? Yes? So I have a question with regard to the relationship with the uh, code actually cost more, not only the single query, but of the whole query calling the <coughs> Jim. Is 
so they make do. Can you explain what you mean by pro this projecting so the plan to? So in the orchest uh, orchestration environment, actually, they aim to create uh, a program that works on, uh, for example, microservices, OK? So you create only one code that looks like a sequential code. Mm -hmm. And actually, say, this is a distributed environment. You have microservices, and you put projectors as in a way you have multiple computers running your same algorithm. And the projection guarantees the correctness of the algorithm, so I know that the local pro uh, algorithm is correct. Then when I try to perform the um, computation into multiple computers, it's still correct, but it doesn't preserve computational complexity. Mm -hmm. So I know that the local algorithm is optimum in a certain way, but then uh, when I create this <coughs> new plan, I would like that even the distributed computation is also, also optimal. And so maybe I recognize the same problem with, for example, a, a Spartan flame, but that maybe you create a truly plan that then it depends even on the architecture we have and maybe it's not So let me see if I understand. So you are saying that uh, once you distribute the data and compute locally uh, the, um, um, the, the, the your query, the sum, the total amount of work performed by all the processors can be larger than the amount of work you, per you would perform on a single server. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, I think it's better if we take this offline. <laughs> yes? Can you perhaps say something about the big changes that you switch to sparse matrices? Hmm? Uh, sparse, sparse matrix and multiplication. Do we have anything in the paper? So, is, uh, so, uh, is working? Yeah. Hello. Let me use that. So there is, uh, it's in, in actually one of the slides, like I, I couldn't get to it. Uh, there is uh, almost, so there is uh, very good results on sparse matrix multiplication too. Uh, tight lower bounds, tight upper bounds too. By the same authors uh, that I, that I, uh, so there's several results that for the dance case, the algorithms, there's several sort of publications that have, uh, they have the ingredients of that algorithm, but one of them have a sort of another, uh, I think, paper with sparse uh, case. But they, we have pointers to it in the, in the, so I might be, so I might be sort of, um, I don't, I don't want to say something wrong. So there's certainly very tight results for that. Um,